Hi, welcome to Chapter 9. In Part 1 of this video lecture, we will be talking about impulse and momentum. Chapter 9 is broken up into three parts. This part um, is covering impulse and momentum. Part 2 will talk about the conservation of momentum. And Part 3 will cover angular momentum and conservation of angular momentum. Let's start this chapter talking about a concept called an impulse. So an impulsive force is a force that lasts for a short duration. Um, there are lots of examples of uh, impulses and impulsive forces that you're familiar with, um, especially in the world of sports. So um, whenever we kick a soccer ball, um, there is a very brief and very powerful force uh, that exists on the ball to get it going. Uh, same thing in golf, you can imagine the extremely high force of the club um, hitting the ball, but obviously that force is only lasting for a very brief um, uh, time period, a, a tiny fraction of a second. Um, this is a nice picture of a tennis ball being struck by a tennis racket, and you can see the tennis ball is actually flattened out, and we'll talk about um, uh, what what this means in the next slide, but here this is another example of an impulse um, being applied to a tennis ball hitting a baseball um, here in boxing or any of the um, combat sports. Um, there are impulses with uh, both fists and feet um, and then in football, of course, uh, many of the tackles are uh, brutally hard and they but they they only last for a short duration. So we just saw that an impulse of force is usually a large force that lasts only a short time. Um, it's interesting to see how this actually plays out when we talk about, for example, applying an impulsive force to a ball. Um, this is a um, slow motion uh, photography, video photography taken of an athlete kicking a soccer ball. And what we notice here is that um, Obviously, before the foot touches the ball, there is no force at all. So if we were to construct a graph of force on the ball as a function of time, it would look something like this. So before the foot makes contact with the ball, we're down here, all right? The force is zero. And then, according to this graph, at 30 milliseconds, all right, notice the time here is in milliseconds. Remember, a millisecond is one thousandth of a second, okay? So this is... Um, 30 milliseconds, contact begins. And that's uh, what's shown right here. Now, as the foot drives through, notice what it's doing. It's flattening out the ball. And therefore, the ball, remember the ball acts as an elastic object, just like a spring. So here we have compression of the ball. This means that the ball is exerting more force and it takes more force to compress the spring here. So this is an example, um, interestingly, of Hooke's Law. So what we see is that as the uh, kick goes through the ball here, um, the, the force goes up at a fast rate. And in this um, graph here, it shows that it reaches a total of about 800 newtons up at this maximum point here. So this is the point of maximum compression. Now what happens after this, remember the ball is starting to move forward. So it starts to um, spring away from the foot and um, toward the end of the kick, notice the ball is not as deformed. It's not as flattened here. That means that this ball, think of it like a spring, it's not as compressed. So there's not as much force acting at it. And so that's what we see here where the force drops back down. And then finally, at about 70 milliseconds, um, contact ends. That means the ball has left the foot um, there's no more force at all on it, and we're in this part of the graph. So this whole impulse here um, had a duration of only about 40 milliseconds, going from uh, 30 here to 70 milliseconds on a graph. Um, and again, here is a picture of a tennis ball while it's being struck, and you can see that you know the ball is is flattened out um, quite a bit. And so this this picture here is probably uh, caught during the point of maximum compression on a graph like this. So now we can relate impulse um, to the average force that was applied during the impulse. And um, this is a, a nice um, math trick that we're gonna use that will make our analysis um, a little bit easier. 
So it turns out that the impulse um, is actually calculated as the area, the shaded area under this curve of force versus time that we saw in the last graph. So um, if that's the case, and this can be proven um, using calculus basically, which we're not gonna do in this course, but we can, um, what we can do is model this same impulse with a, an average force, F sub av, that um, gives us the same impulse. In other words, this average force here, notice it has the same duration, delta T, as the actual force here, but we're gonna assume that this force just turns on, is at a maximum value here, and then stays at that constant value until the end of the impulse is over, and then we're down to zero force. But the key thing here is this rectangle here has the same area as this shaded region up here. Therefore, the impulse is the same and the effect of, for example, the tennis racket on the ball is exactly the same in either one of these cases. So um, remembering that um, the impulse is equal to the area here, the area of a rectangle is of course its height times its width. So the height of this rectangle is the average force and the width or length of the rectangle is the time duration of the impulse, which is delta T. So this is our, our definition here of impulse. Impulse is given um, the letter J and that's most likely so that we don't confuse impulse. If we called it I, um, we were just dealing with rotational inertia, moment of inertia, which also uses the letter I. Um, so we're kind of running out of um, letters in the alphabet here. So impulse is, is usually given the letter J. So our definition of impulse J is the product of the force, the average force acting on the object times the duration of how long the impulse lasts. A few years ago, the top um, tennis player in the United States was Andy Roddick, and he was known for his huge serve. He was one of the first guys to um, hit a tennis ball serve 150 miles per hour. And um, so this is a, uh, a force versus time curve of the impulse um, that models his serve, all right? And it's an approximation. Notice it's uh, instead of that nice smooth curve, we've made it into a triangle here, uh, but the effect will um, be the same and it'll be a, a, a decent model to use. So notice a couple things here. Um, first of all, the, the length of duration here of the impulse is very short. It's five milliseconds. So that's five thousandths of a second. And also notice the peak here is a very large force, 1500 newtons of force. So um, remember that the impulse is the area under the curve. So what we have to do to find the impulse of this serve is just find the area of this triangle here. So remember the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So we have one half and the base is five milliseconds. That's shown here. Now we have to write it out in terms of seconds for the proper units. And the height of the triangle is our maximum force here, 1500 newtons. So we have one half times 0.005 times 1500, which is 3.75 newton seconds. So notice the units of impulse are newton seconds. Um, what, what we can do here is also figure out what the average force was during um, this whole impulse here. And remember the average force uh, is equal to the impulse divided by the duration because J is equal to F average times delta T. So we're just solving for the average force here. So we have 3.75 divided by the duration of 0.005 and that gives us an average force of 750 Newtons. Notice also that the average force here is exactly halfway between the low point of the curve, which is zero, and the high point, which is 1,500. So the average force is right here in the middle. So let's go ahead and use this um, average force that we just calculated for um, Andy Roddick's serve and do a little bit of uh, dynamics and kinematics. So um, a tennis ball, it turns out, um, has a mass of 57 grams. So let's see what this um, force here would do to a 57 gram tennis ball. So remember what we're gonna do is instead of using this pink actual curve here, we're gonna model the impulse as this green curve here 
because it has the exact same area, therefore it should produce the exact same result. So the force that causes the ball to accelerate, according to Newton's second law, we know that F equals ma. So the acceleration is the average force divided by the mass of the ball. We know that the average force we calculated to be 750 newtons, that's right here, and the mass of the ball in kilograms is 0 0.057, remember 57 grams. And so um, when we do this on our calculator, notice what we get for an acceleration, 13,200 meters per second squared. Um, this is a huge acceleration. Remember the acceleration due to gravity is only 9.8. So let's um, finish up this the kinematics here and think about, all right, what if this object, this tennis ball, has this acceleration, 13,200, coming off of the racket. Now remember, it's only going to accelerate as long as this force is applied. So the acceleration only lasts for five milliseconds, but we can figure out what the final velocity would be. Remember from kinematics, the final velocity is equal to the initial velocity, which is zero, all right, before he hits the ball, it's zero. And then all we have to do is multiply acceleration times the time, delta t. So we have 13,200 times the five milliseconds, 0 0.005, and that gives us a final velocity of 66 meters per second, and that can be converted um, if you, you know, do the conversion. That turns out to be the 150 miles per hour um, that we were looking for. So the next part of this um, lecture, and the, the last part of this, at least part one of the lecture, we're going to introduce a new concept that's very important in physics. It's called momentum, and it's related to impulse. So um, let's go back and take a look at Newton's second law, which we know very well by now. Um, the net force, F, is equal to ma, mass times acceleration. And remember, acceleration is defined as the change in velocity divided by the time um, of the acceleration. All right, so, um, or the time that they took the velocity to change, I should say. So what we can do here is let's substitute delta V over delta T. Let's substitute that in here for A. So Newton's second law says that force is equal to mass times delta V over delta T. Now in this course, we are going to only work with systems that have a constant mass. Um, there are um, some interesting problems um, where the mass of a system actually changes. For example, when a rocket burns its fuel, it gets lighter as it flies. But um, that's a little more advanced and we're not gonna do that in Physics 101. So let's take this M mass, since it's constant, and do a little trick here. We're gonna move it up here next to the velocity. We're gonna put the M next to the V. Now remember, M doesn't change, okay? So we're not gonna worry about that. Um, it's not a changing, uh, parameter, so we can stick it up here inside um, the parentheses and put it with velocity. So remember that uh, delta means final minus initial, it's a change. So this delta mv is mv final minus mv initial, okay? And again, the mass, you know, is the same here and here. What's changing is the velocity in, in this course. That's all we're gonna look at. Okay, now let's take this delta t down here and let's move it over here with the force. So we just multiply both sides of this equation by delta t. So I end up with force times delta t is equal to delta mv, all right? That's this, this term right here. Now, we've seen this before. Force times duration is what the definition of an impulse is. So on the left side, this is just j. So what this tells us is sort of a cause and effect. This says that J, the impulse, causes a change in the product of mass times velocity, all right? It causes a change in MV. And um, Newton realized that, you know, this was um, an important product because it keeps showing up uh, when he deals with things like impulses and so forth. So this um, product of M and V is called momentum. It's the definition of momentum. So momentum is a new um, concept for us here. Um, it's a new quantity and it's a vector um, and it's given the letter P, all right? Now, um, again, we've already used M for mass. 
So it would be very confusing to call this M, okay? So momentum is called P. And so P is defined as the product of the mass of an object times its velocity. And um, again, the little arrow above the P reminds us that it's a vector and it points in the same direction as the object's velocity. Let's just do a couple of quick, simple calculations um, to calculate the momentum of some objects. So um, first of all, let's take something um, on one extreme, something very light, um, a fly, a house fly, has a mass of uh, 10 milligrams, all right, that's 10 thousandth of a gram, um, obviously extremely low mass, um, and it's flying at five meters per second, all right, which is actually, you know, pretty fast. But let's calculate its momentum. So P is equal to mv. So um, we have to put this, um, this tiny mass here, we have to convert it to kilograms. So 10 milligrams turns out to be 10 to the minus five kilograms, all right? And obviously in terms of a kilogram, a fly is, is very small, has small mass. And we multiply that just by um, its uh, velocity, which is five meters per second. And so um, you can actually do this, you don't need a calculator, this is just five times 10 to the minus five. And notice the units of momentum are kilograms, meters per second, because the kilograms comes from the M, the mass, and the meters per second comes from the speed or the velocity. So this is a, a small number, and um, this is not a surprise. Something as tiny and lightweight as a, as a fly is not gonna have a lot of momentum. Let's do something um, kind of at the other opposite extreme. A locomotive has a mass of 50,000 kilograms and is traveling at 30 meters per second. So its momentum is given by mv, 50,000 kilograms times 30 meters per second, and that's um, a momentum of 1,500,000 kilogram meters per second. So the, the point here is that the train here has a lot more momentum than a fly, okay? And that's probably not a surprise. Uh, momentum measures the tendency of an object to keep going in a straight line. So if you try to, if you think about momentum as, um, you know, how hard would it be to stop both of these objects, right? Well, it depends on their momentum. So a train, this speeding train, obviously would be extremely difficult to stop compared to the fly. Why? Because of its large momentum. So that's really the, the meaning of and concept of momentum. We can tie together the concepts of impulse and momentum very nicely in something that's called the impulse momentum theorem. So remember from a couple slides ago, when we started with Newton's second law, F equals MA, and you know we replaced the acceleration A with delta V over delta T, and then we moved the M up on top, and we ended up with delta MV on top. Well, remember that MV is what we call momentum. So let's just replace MV with P. So this is a form, a different form of Newton's second law. Um, it's still the same law, but it's just sort of dressed up a little differently. It's written in terms of the change in momentum. So this now says, instead of uh, force equals mass times acceleration, this is saying that force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the duration of how long it took to change it. Another way to think of this, this is the rate of change of momentum, okay? So um, a force causes a rate of change of momentum. Um, now, what we can do here is we can take delta T down here and move it to the left side by multiplying both sides here by delta T. So what we end up with here on the left is F average, the average force times delta T, but remember, that's J, that's impulse. And what's left on the right side is just the numerator, which is delta P. So this is the impulse momentum theorem. What it says is that an impulse J causes a change in momentum, delta P, all right? And they are equal to each other. The, the amount of impulse is exactly equal to the change in momentum of an object. So this is a nice um, uh, dynamics type equation that involves cause and effect, all right? The, the 
the impulsive force here for a duration of delta t, that creates an impulse and that causes a change in an object's momentum. So a force produces an impulse which causes a change in momentum. Um, you'll see next um, just a real simple uh, demonstration with a skateboard that shows the effects of various impulses um, on the change in momentum of the skateboard. Here I'm going to do just a simple demonstration to show the effects of various impulse strengths um, on the change in momentum of an object here. So we have the skateboard here on the table, and uh, remember that impulse J is the product of the force times the duration of the force. So either one of those will create a larger impulse, and remember impulse changes the momentum of the object. So for example, if I just use my finger and just briefly give a tiny little push to the skateboard like this, that, that was a very small impulse because the force was small and the duration was short. So together that made for a very weak impulse. And as a result, we see that the skateboard just barely gets going, right? We just give it a, a little bit of momentum there. Now, there's a couple things I can do to increase the impulse. Um, first of all, I can keep the same weak force just with my finger pushing, but I can increase the duration of the force. So in other words, I can push for a longer amount of time. Let's see what happens now. Now we see that the, the impulse was larger because of the duration. All right, so I'll do it one more time. We'll push with a, a weak force, but a long duration, and we can see that the skateboard gains a lot of momentum from the larger impulse. The other way, of course, to make the impulse larger is to increase the force. And so um, what I can do is I can use this hammer and even though it's going to be a very brief impulse uh, when I tap it, um, obviously this is going to be a larger force than just my finger. Let's watch what happens here. So again, you can see now, even though it was an extremely brief impulse, uh, because of the large force from the hammer, uh, we have a larger change of momentum of our cart. Let's go ahead next and do um, a numeric example um, that uses the impulse momentum theorem. And this is a, a, you know, a pretty common occurrence here with something bouncing off of a of surface. So for example, if you throw a ball um, against a wall um, horizontally, it will bounce back and you can catch it, right? So we're gonna analyze this problem using impulse and momentum. So a ball bounces off a wall with the speeds shown below. So here's the before picture. We see the ball, it's moving to the right, and the ball has a mass of 0.25 kilograms, and it has a speed of 1.3 meters per second. Here's our wall. During the collision, all right, the ball, remember, is going to deform and flatten out. So this is the uh, duration uh, here of the um, impulse of the wall pushing on the ball. And we're told that this collision takes one-tenth of a second. And then afterwards, notice the ball has, is bouncing back and it has a little less speed. It's coming back at 1.1 meters per second um, in the opposite direction, okay? So um, the, the uh, question says, find the impulse and the average force of the collision. All right, so let's look at this from a, a momentum um, perspective. In the before picture, the initial momentum of the ball so it's P sub I, where I is for initial, is equal to the mass of the ball times the initial speed or initial velocity of the ball, V sub I. All right, so we've got 0.25 for mass times 1.3 for speed, and that gives us an initial momentum of 0 0.325 moving to the right. Okay, so that's our positive direction. You can see our little X axis down here. So this is positive momentum. After the collision, the ball is coming back to the left. So its final momentum, P sub F, is equal to the mass of the ball, same mass, 0.25 kilograms, times its final velocity, which is negative 1.1. So the final momentum then is negative 0.275. So notice what happened during this um, experiment here where we throw a ball against the wall. 
the momentum goes from a positive quantity here to a negative quantity here. So that's obviously um, a, a change in momentum. So um, remember that impulse, J, is equal to the change in momentum of the ball. And change in momentum is just final momentum minus initial momentum. So we have negative 0.275, this is the final momentum here, minus this momentum right here in the uh, initial momentum before the collision. So we have two minuses here. So you know when we, we have to be careful of those signs um, when we do this on our calculator. So they um, basically, when we add those together with the, the correct signs, we get a, a change in momentum of negative 0.6 kilogram meters per second. All right, the, chain, the, the momentum change is negative because it started out you know, as positive momentum and it ended up with negative momentum. So we know what J is, we know what delta P is. Remember the average force is equal to delta P, which is negative 0.6 from right here, divided by the duration of the collision, which was given as 0.1 seconds, so that gives us a, an average force of negative six newtons. Now, um, what does this minus sign tell us here? Well, the force on the ball during the collision was to the left. And that makes sense, right? The ball is hitting the wall. The wall is pushing on the ball to the left. So that is a negative force. And that's, that shows up here um, as the minus sign in our answer. One really important and graphic example, um, an application of impulse and uh, momentum is the uh, use of airbags for safety in, in automobiles. Um, and you know, in the old days, cars of course didn't have airbags. They're uh, something relatively new in the last couple of decades at least. Um, so let's say um, you're driving your car at 45 miles per hour, which is 20 meters per second, and you get in a head-on collision like and let's say, you know, in the old days, um, this was, you know, 1950 or something like this, um, your car has no airbags. So, um, and also maybe you didn't have a seatbelt. So what's gonna happen here? Well, your head is gonna come forward and hit the windshield and come to a stop in a relatively short amount of time. Something like um, 10 milliseconds is probably um, a reasonable estimate. So we're gonna calculate the average force on your head during this collision. So how do we do this? Well, we can use our result that says that the average force, remember this is Newton's second law, average force is equal to ma, but it's also equal to change in momentum divided by delta t. So we're gonna have the final momentum, um, this is of your head actually, right? We're gonna use the head as the object here, minus the initial momentum of your head divided by the time of the collision. Now, in, after the collision, your head comes to a stop. So the final speed or velocity of your head in a car accident is zero. It's the initial velocity that is equal to the speed of your car, which is, was given as 20 meters per second, all right? So the average force um, on your head during this collision is the mass of your head, and I had to look this one up to find out that an average human head is around five kilograms. So we have five kilograms times your initial speed, 20 meters per second, um, and it's negative, all right, because um, uh, it, it's a negative change in momentum there. And we divide that by the 10 milliseconds down here, 0.01 seconds, and we end up with a very large average force, negative 10,000 Newtons. Now, to put some perspective to this number, you remember a Newton is a unit of force just as a pound is, so converting this to pounds this is an average force of 2,250 pounds on your head, on your skull. And obviously this would um, fracture your skull and almost certainly kill you, all right? So not a good thing. So air, air bags to the rescue here. So let's recalculate the average force on your head if you have airbags. The airbag increases the duration of contact to 100 milliseconds, all right? So when the airbag deploys, what happens now is your head still comes forward and strikes the airbag, but it takes more time for your head to come to a stop 
because it's this airbag is meeting it sort of halfway and your head has to push in and deflate the airbag. So this, this takes more time. It takes about 10 times as long as it does for your head just to hit a solid object like the windshield of your car. So when we redo this problem, the, the, all the numbers are pretty much the same up on top, okay? We have, you know, still the final speed of your head is zero. We have the initial speed is 20 meters per second. But here's the difference. The duration of the force is now 0.1 seconds. 100 milliseconds is 0.1 seconds. It's 10 times longer than up here. So what that does is when we divide this, we end up with a force that's 10 times less. Now it's minus 1,000 newtons, and that equates to about 225 pounds. Now 225 pounds on your head um, is still, you know, quite a bit of force, but that's probably not going to crack your skull, right? That's like a very heavy person that um, basically sits on your head. Um, the one other thing that the airbag does, and you can see it in this picture here, and this is also very important and another reason why airbags work so well. The airbag spreads up the force out over a larger area. Remember, we talked about stress, stress and strain. Stress is defined as force per unit area. So when your head hits a solid hard object like a windshield, the area of um, compression or area of where the um, collision takes place on your head is very small. It's, it's just a tiny spot on your head. So all that force is concentrated into a small area. But with the airbag here, you can see the whole front of your head and face is, is kind of enveloped inside this airbag. So this force of 225 pounds is spread out over a larger area, greatly reducing the stress. Our last slide here in this part of the lecture is the concept of total momentum. Remember that momentum is a vector. And so uh, when we have uh, multiple objects with different momenta, for example, these three uh, billiard balls are all moving in different directions at different speeds, the total momentum of the system is found by adding up the individual momenta of each of the objects. Now, um, one thing that we have to be careful of here is remember this, these are vectors. So when we add up um, different momenta, we have to use vector addition. So we would have to do some sort of tip to tail method to find the total momentum vector, or we would work with components. And um, in the next part of this lecture, when we deal with collisions and conservation of momentum, uh, we are gonna work with the components if we're dealing with the two dimensional momentum problem like this. Um, I'll leave you with one um, conceptual quiz here. Let's say uh, shown in this picture, two trains are approaching each other. Each train has the same mass and the same speed, and the momentum of each train is one million kilogram meters per second. So what is the total momentum of this system? Think about that for a second, uh, maybe pause the video and see if you can come up with this answer. Well, what did you get? Well, the total momentum of this system is zero. And um, the reason for that, of course, is that this momentum here is opposite this momentum here. And so when we add them together, they basically cancel each other, all right? And this is a concept that we're going to be dealing with in the next part of this lecture, um, total momentum and how momentum like this can cancel each other to give you zero, even though we have two very heavy and very fast moving objects. So that's it for part one of this lecture. I'll see you shortly in part two. Goodbye.